Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrew Flam. I'm the Regional Director at the Pace University Small Business Development Center. We really appreciate you all taking the time to join us for the third session in our series of integrating the value of sustainability into a small business model. And we are delighted to have uh, back two distinguished speakers, uh, my colleague here at Pace University, Professor Steve Mezio, as well as uh, Rick Kravitz. And I'll do a more formal intro of, of those two gentlemen in just a moment. Uh, first off, just wanted to, again, welcome you all. Um, Pace University's Small Business Development Center is one of 22 centers located throughout the state. And we offer a wide range of in-person, one-on-one business advisory services, helping small businesses with issues such as access to finance, uh, marketing and sales strategies, uh, procurement strategies, things about how to access and, and uh, be able to secure government contracts, as well as looking at different operational issues and uh, you know things to be able to help build and grow your business here in New York State. Our network is funded by a wide range of uh, funding support from both uh, the federal side as well as the Small Business Administration, as well as through New York State and our host campuses. Again, we're located here in Pace University in Lower Manhattan, so we certainly appreciate the support of all of the institutions and, and, and levels of government um, to enable us to do the work that we do. So our focus, as I said, is on one-on-one -on -one business uh, advisory, uh, but we also do, as a network, a wide range of training programming, uh, focusing on um, you know, targeted uh, issues of, of note to help businesses build and grow here in New York State. Um, today's session, as I said, is going to be on sustainability in a small business model, looking at ESG and how that can really help build and grow your business. A couple of quick things I want to notice, I said I'll add these items in the chat in a moment, but wanted to reference with respect to our business advisory services as a very brief um, counseling request form that if you can fill that out, that will enable you to connect with the um, center closest to you. As I said, this is a... Uh, um, an offering that we're putting forward, you know, statewide. So if you're here in New York City, obviously we're delighted to work with you. If you're elsewhere in the state, you, know, you can also connect with an SBDC that's closest to you uh, to be able to work with them directly. Um, and one final note I'll make, I mean, while a, a wide range of, you know, we spent it, as I'm sure many of you have over the past two plus years, um, thinking about kind of how to build and grow and, and kind of recover and amend your business model with respect to kind of all the challenges that are associated with COVID-19. Um, so there are a number of pandemic relief programs that have uh, sunset, but there are a number that are still in place, uh, you know, both through uh, various government sources as well as through, you know, foundations and other private sector sources. So if these are issue areas that you're looking to look into, um, certainly we would encourage you to connect with a business advisor to be able to make sure that you're aware of what's out there. Uh, that's still uh, available and, and kind of that's a possibility for you. So um, again, really appreciate you all taking the time to join us today. And um, with that, I wanted to turn over the floor to uh, my esteemed colleagues, Professor Steve Mezio, who's the head of uh, Pace's uh, Lubin School of Business Center for Sustainable Business, uh, as well as a professor here at, at Lubin and a terrific guy, as well as another terrific guy, Rick Kravitz, uh, from the CPA Journal. And uh, we're really delighted to have you both back for session three of this series. I think it's been really insightful so far and uh, look forward to your, your comments and remarks today. So, gentlemen, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew, for the gracious introduction. And thank you for you and the audience for the opportunity for uh, Rick and I to present Today, this is the third of our three-part uh, webinar series on integrating ESG into small business. And the topic today is gonna focus on communication. And what we mean by communication is, as a business, as a small business, how, do, how, how best to communicate to your stakeholders, your customers, your community, your vendors, what you're doing uh, with respect to integrating ESG and how you're performing with respect to ESG. Rick and I have worked together quite extensively, and we're 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 very passionate about the topic of ESG generally, but also we are passionate about uh, small business, which is the uh, in, in in our view the heartbeat of business around around the world. So if we go to the next slide, we can see our agenda for today. It's it's a it's a simple agenda, but we think uh, it'll be informative. Um, for those of you in the audience that did not have the opportunity to sit through our first two webinars, I'm just going to spend a minute summarizing some of the key issues that we discussed 
Webinar one was a general discussion about ESG. If you can go back to the agenda, please. Webinar one was a, was, was a, a small, uh, was a discussion around uh, general issues around ESG, and webinar two was around the purpose statement, which I'll describe in a minute. But the bulk of the presentation today is number two on the agenda, which is about is, is all about communicating sustainability. And, and we're using, we intentionally use the word communicate. What you might experience in your own uh, business worlds is, is um, many people discussing the idea of reporting ESG impact or reporting ESG outcome outcomes. You'll also hear the term transparency quite a bit in the ESG domain, which is the idea of being transparent about what you as a business are doing with respect to ESG. We're, we're taking those terms and, and putting them under a broad umbrella that we're calling communication. And you'll see as we proceed with the discussion why, why we think communication is an important way to uh, position this. Within this communicating sustainability, we're going to talk about why communicating sustainability is important. Specifically, what do we mean by communicating sustainability? To whom are we communicating? And how best to communicate? So with that, I'll, we will go to the next slide now, please. And, and um, just a quick overview on what we covered in the previous uh, webinars. And they are, by the way, if you uh, are interested and you did not attend them, they are available uh, in video on, on YouTube. Uh, so you can uh, always go back if you choose to do that. So the Steve, first... thank you. Sorry to interrupt. I guess I did just add a link where people can see the recordings into the chat. Thank Excellent. You. Thank you thanks. for making reference to that. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. And, uh, and so in webinar one, we, we covered very high level macro level issues, even, even in terms of defining what sustainability is, defining ESG, some of the some of the approaches and applications uh, for ESG benefits of integrating ESG into a small business model. And we began a brief discussion about reporting ESG impacts and outcomes, which we will do a deeper dive on today. The second webinar was very narrowly focused on uh, purpose, what we call an integrated purpose, which is the idea of integrating both profit a profit orientation and an ESG orientation. And we have a few slides that we will uh, review that because the purpose, the integrated purpose is, it plays a foundational role in communicating ESG impacts and outcomes. So if we go to the next slide now, we'll begin our, the substance of our webinar today. We'll start with the first question of why. why. Why is it important to communicate sustainability regardless of the size of your company, and by the way, regardless of, of your maturity in terms of ESG integration. You know, some, some small businesses, some businesses generally are just starting out um, thinking about how to best integrate ESG into their business models. Communication, even for those companies in the very early stages or even in the planning stages, is as important as it is for those that are in a more mature state of integrating ESG. So, so let's look at the why on the next on the next slide. We have two sort of major consultancy firms that that not only deal with large companies, but they they do quite a bit of research and quite a bit of consultancy around SMEs or small and medium sized enterprise small businesses. And you can see, you know, so so the question is why is communicating sustainability important? And 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 ESG asserts it's the new lens through which companies are going to be evaluated. You know what does that mean? That that your performance, even as a smaller organization, is increasingly being viewed through the lens of an ESG performance metric model. And that doesn't mean that the traditional measures of of success and performance are not continuing to be evaluated, such as profits. Um, and, 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 and growth, but, but, but ESG, environmental responsibility and social responsibilities are now part of the equation in, in addition to profits. McKinsey, uh, in, 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 the, in, the bottom, in the bottom quote, says companies should integrate ESG into their purpose, strategy, and business models and act on them. And, and we particularly find this quote to resonate to reality because some organizations are, are approaching ESG as sort of a compartmentalized sort of event within the company that's not tethered or integrated with the bigger macro picture of the organization. 
i.e. tethered to the business strategy, tethered to the purpose of the business, and, and looking at it as equal to all other priorities and strategies of the organization. So, so, it's, it's, so, so why it's a big deal to, to the marketplace and to your stakeholders. So, so, so what's happening in, in, in the environment right now? And you can see at the top bullet, it's, 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 you know, I don't need to tell the audience what's happening now with market supply and inflation and supply chain interruptions, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot on everyone's plates now, big and small organizations. And, and so, so some might say, well, ESG is just sort of dropping down into the priority chart. But, but, but we caution you and say, this is actually a good time to be focused on the three pillars of environmental, social, governance, as well as profits. In that context, communicating clearly, directly, and frequently, clearly, in simple terms, directly with your cohorts of stakeholders, for example, employees and customers, and frequently as to what you're doing with respect to integrating ESG and how you're doing with respect to ESG. And again, just as, as I mentioned earlier, regardless of the maturity level you're at, even if you're just getting started and just in the planning phase, your stakeholders want to hear about what you're doing and, and greatly appreciate and, and will assign great value to you if, if they're hearing from you on what your plans are and what your, what your strategy is going forward. So we have three major bullets as to the, in the third uh, area, why communicate ESG? The first one we believe is to signal your commitment to ESG. The second is to explain how you're pursuing this idea of an integrated purpose. And we're defining an integrated purpose as what uh, a, a theory that's popular today called the triple bottom line. And, and, and that triple bottom line basically says uh, an organization, regardless of size or sector or geographic location, is going to place equal weight on people, which is the, the, the S in ESG, the planet, which is the E in ESG, and, and clearly profits, which is part of the G or the governance section of ESG. So this, this idea, instead of one bottom line of profits, we're, we're looking at a triple bottom line of people, planet, and profits. So signal your commitment, explain how you're integrating the triple bottom line, and then demonstrate through performance metrics, through, through updates, how, you, how the organization is creating long-term value by focusing on environmental stewardship, social responsibility, and prudent governance, which again includes the profit element. If we go to the next slide, please, um, we now look at the, so we looked at why is it important to communicate sustainability? So the next question we, we thought we would address is what, what are you communicating? Like what is this sustainability communication consist of? So we start on the next slide with, with, with this, this purpose-driven organization. And I mentioned at the introduction that our second seminar was exclusively uh, focused on purpose and purpose statements. But we thought we'd just give a brief uh, overview because how important it is as a foundational attribute to communicating ESG impacts, performance, and outcomes. So it's really all about communicating your, miss your mission business purpose to your stakeholders, which all organizations are doing anyway. Uh, the difference with this ESG integration is that you're now expanding this communication to discuss how ESG is integrated now into your mission, into your strategy. Um, you know, we'll talk about this more later. How, how this ESG communication is taking place is, is varied and, and depends on how your organization best communicates. It's usually a combination of, of briefings. If you're a publicly traded company, perhaps you do this on an earnings call. If you're, if you're not, you, you may use you're using websites, social media. And increasingly, many companies of all sizes are using formal uh, ESG reports. Uh, you can see uh, Harvard Business School um, is, is clear that, that, that firms that are adopting this integrated purpose-driven sort of ESG people, planet, profits, um, purpose, uh, see real competitive advantages in the marketplace. On the next slide, we're, we're going to take a look at what a purpose statement is. This is a quick review, a, single, a simple statement that defines the reason you exist. I'm going to show you a couple of examples on the next slide when we get to it. But again, beyond making a profit, environmental stewardship, social responsibility, including. 
illustrates how your unique product services positively impact the people you serve in addition to the environmental impact. Once this purpose statement is established, goals, strategies, priorities, communication, all then link to that particular purpose. And I can tell you, we're gonna look at a few examples on the next slide and companies of all, if you go to the next slide, please, companies of all sizes uh, and, and sectors are spending quite a bit of time drafting these one and two sentence purpose statements. Here, here are just three random examples across uh, sectors. First one is, and these are real companies, our purpose is to support health and well-being of our planet and everyone who lives here. The second one is our purpose is to increase accessibility to life-saving equipment for patients in underdeveloped countries. And the third one is our purpose is to provide people with the ability to purchase products they need at a price that they can afford. And you can see quite simply stated, but, 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 but integrates this idea that, look, we're still gonna be a profitable organization. If we're not a profitable organization, that doesn't help the environment or society because our employees depend on us, the local communities we operate in depend on us, our vendors depend on us, our customers depend on us. So we wanna be profitable, but at the same time, how best do we integrate, the, do we maintain that profitability goal while at the same time make contributions to the environment and to society. And, and when we say contributions, we mean not only doing good things for those, but, but reduce the amount of negative impact we have on society and on, and on the environment. Go to the next slide. In, in, in summary on the what, so what do we communicate? There's, there's, there's so many things. Uh, we, we narrowed it down to several bullets here, but, but, but the first and foremost, is you want your cohorts of stakeholders to really understand what your particular passion is. And I, I intentionally use the word passion because purpose statements are generally are generally rooted into the passion of the organization. I and mean, let's face it, if you, you're, you're a company, particularly a smaller company, you can't solve all the world's environmental and all the world's social problems. So what do you do then? And what we're seeing that works quite well and 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 can make a real difference at the same time is to narrow the focus substantially, at least at the beginning. So for example, um, there's a uh, company that sells socks. It's called Bombas. Some of you may be familiar with it, B-O-M-B-A-S. And Bombas started out on Shark Tank as a, as a startup company. And their whole business model was rooted from the very beginning in this integrated notion of profits and purpose. ESG purpose. And what their business model was from the very beginning was for every pair of socks that we sell, we will donate one pair of socks to a homeless shelter. And they discovered in their market research as they were designing their company strategy was that socks was the number one requested item in homeless shelters. And so they said, well, great. So we're gonna make the best pair of socks ever, but at the same time for every pair that we sell, we will donate one. And that, that was from the first day of business they started doing. It. Fast forward a number of years, they are a multi-million dollar organization now, highly successful, and continue with that one pair of socks donated for each pair sold. But now because they've expanded their product line, they now donate socks, t-shirts, and other things for every item that they sell. And I think that's a really good example of not trying, Bombas was not trying to solve every problem in ESG, but basically said, here's what we think we can do a really good job at, and really focus on, and, and, and their focus was primarily on a societal impact. So communicate purpose, and then from that purpose, dovetails down into your priorities, your mission, your value, um, tactics and logistics, ESG impacts and outcomes, and transparency. And we'll talk about these bullets in more detail as we uh, go on. So the next slide, uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, my esteemed colleague, Rick, who has spent quite a bit of time on this notion of whom are we going to communicate our ESG impacts, outcomes, and performance. I thank you for this opportunity. So if we go to the next slide. From a 40,000 foot level, uh, you could look at the PwC, which is one of the largest uh, accounting consulting firms. Um, 
it's from the demand from the bottom. The voice of the stakeholders have spoken. Companies with a commitment to ESG policies will outlast their competitors without. And if you go to the next slide. So why do we communicate sustainability? The fact is what you communicate is your brand and your brand identity. And what you're trying to do is create long-term sustainable value. And the way to do that is to become stakeholder centric. What do we mean by that? It's not the shareholder investors, but all of the interested individuals and the parties. So it's the employees and human capital is what we look at in terms of the ESG model, the value of, of human capital, the value to the organization, their institutional knowledge, their relationship with customers, their business method processes, all of the things that is unique to the organization and where stability is absolutely critical. Then we look okay. to the vendors. In, go ahead, Steve. Yeah. No, I was just going to say, and Rick, the, 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 I'm sorry to interrupt you, but the interesting thing about what you're saying is um, two things. One, employees are really part of your cohort of stakeholders and, and a huge part of it because if we don't engage a passion in employees, it's going to be much harder to engage a passion in, in your other cohorts. But if you see over on the on the graphic on the left, right, these are the these are examples of cohorts of stakeholders. But each business would define these. Well, they they define their own cohorts. So. Absolutely. And and the yeah. employees. I mean, what are some of the other things that make uh, an an organization or your institution great? Basically, the processes that the employees know, the customer relationships, the intelligent workforce, um, efficient operations. So critically, this is really important to communicate, to maintain a satisfied and stable workforce. And there's various ways to measure this. Even in small business, it's very, it's very important to look at this and to do an introspective look to your business. There's what are your, and, and this is standard, and you could do this very simply, but it's very important to look at. What are your turnover rates? What have been your promotions within your organization by gender, age, and sex? What is the average time per position? And how about employee satisfaction? I mean, do you look at Glassdoor? Do you look at LinkedIn? Do you look at confidential employee survey, uh, surveys? This is absolutely critical because this is the intellectual capital that brings your brand to the public. As far as vendors and suppliers, another critical element of your long-term value creation and success. Um, the value to the organization, fair dealing, honest relationships, ethical sourcing of goods and services, open and honest communication, excellent uh, trade relations, excellent interpersonal relationships. And it's regarding supply chain sourcing. And as you know, this is a major issue today because of the interruption in supply. Can you identify the materials and goods and where they're sourced from? And are they sustainable? Are your customers asking about sustainable uh, sourcing? Are they ethically manufactured? And do you seek out more sustainably sourced goods? It's, it's very clear and it's very easy to do in small business. As far as the community, I look at this as your brand. It's really all about how you portray yourself to the community. Good governance, ethical leadership, fair treatment of employees, honest and honesty and long-term value creation that benefits all stakeholders. The employees that live in your community pay taxes to the community. So the health, welfare, and benefit to the community from your uh, tax paying employees is critical. And then of course, shareholder investor relations. I also, uh, regulators, I also look at future investors and future shareholders. You know, are you a purpose-driven company? Is this recognized? Are you communicating this to your investors and your stakeholders, to your uh, uh, lenders? And uh, are you communicating that you're a purpose-driven organization? What is your reason to exist? Are you communicating that uh, as, as your special brand? It's all stakeholder focused. And of course, influencers, rating agencies, activists, associations. Today, social media, and and uh, the internet uh, provide tremendous avenues for communicating 
your, your brand and your ethics. And it's absolutely critical because the next generation of professionals, the people that are actually buying your goods and services are critically interested in, in your ethical uh, framework and, and, and DNA background. Rick, Rick, if I could just if I could just add, um, sure. th th what you're saying is so important. And, and if you look at at least our definition of cohorts of stakeholders here, and 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 you look at vendors, for example, and suppliers, I mentioned the word transparency early on in, in, in the discussion this morning, and 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 this is in some respects a little bit unfair for for some organizations, but the, but the public. The influencers, your stakeholders, are expecting you as a business to fully understand what your vendors and suppliers are doing and what the sourcing of your products are. And 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 that's I say it's a little bit unfair because sometimes that's not even transparent to a company. You you might be sourcing products and services that then get further sourced and further sourced, so your supply chain gets very complicated and very extended where you can't see beyond the direct supplier that you're working with, and you don't know what that supplier and how that supplier is sourcing things. And, and so in spite of that difficulty and in spite of the lack of transparency, the, the expectation for your stakeholders is that you understand exactly what's happening on your full remote supply chain and in terms of environmental and social issues. On, on, on shareholders and investors, you know, many small businesses don't have shareholders or they might just have owners. Or investors, but but most will do some kind of funding, loans, et cetera. And, and increasingly, financial institutions, regardless of the size of the company, are, are placing uh, ESG-related sort of benchmarks around funding, around lending, which is to say, if you report to us, if you communicate to us periodically how you're performing, on certain social and environmental measures that will impact how much we lend and the rates that we lend by. And, and that's happening across industries and across sizes of companies, Rick. And Steve, to, to one other uh, point regarding influencers, um, I think it's critically important, and this may be one of the best takeaways you can have from our seminar, is that your message is your brand and it will attract the next generation of professionals whether they're future investors or future lenders or future employees your message is your brand so my question is in the influencer arena are you listed in ethosphere or any or other ethical rating agencies millions of people look at these rating agencies is your organization perceived in the community as that you want it to be are you viewed as by outsiders as being socially responsible in an ethically managed organization? And do you look at social media and what people are saying about you? And do you use reputational protection services to monitor your brand on the internet? For example, some of your competitors may do really bad things and you need to be very aware in social media that you're protecting yourself against dishonest posting by competitors. Absolutely critical because reputation can destroy your brand. Yeah, and, and and to your point, Rick, there are now sort of activists and influencers that are, if you're not reporting what you're doing with ESG, they are going to report it for you by just scrubbing all your media sites and all your communications. And and you know, you, you know, our view is as an organization, you want to be in control of the messaging and the signaling that you're sending, not 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 have someone else uh, doing it uh, for you. Okay, Rick. Okay, next slide. So we talked a little about uh, who you communicate with. Let's talk a little more about how you communicate this. Next slide. Yeah. Okay. So many companies, of course, recognize ESG issues and opportunities in their core business, but they don't get credit for it because they don't communicate it. And that is so critical. You may have one of the best businesses, but if you want to create long-term sustainable growth and, and, and value creation uh, over the long term, you really need to communicate your, your brand. Yeah, I, I mean, we see time after time, I, I speak to, to, to companies, even large companies, but by companies of, across sizes and sectors, and 
And, and you know, we talk about, okay, what, what do we need to do? And, and, and the first thing we always ask is, well, what are you doing already? And, 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 and surprisingly to some, some of these organizations, they're doing quite a bit. In fact, in, in some organizations, they don't even need to do any more than they're already doing, but they need to really elevate it, elevate what they're doing, more formalize what they're doing, and to Rick's point, better communicate with them already. Okay, next slide. Again, this is here's some of your takeaways. Your message is your brand, and that your social media today and in the internet and reputational capital drive sales, long term value creation. They bring customers, they bring uh, the community, uh, and, and, and your influence uh, on them and their influence on you uh, uh, to the forefront. So I, again, we ask, you know, are you listed in any of the ethical rating agencies? And what about your reviews? Do you look at your reviews on Glassdoor and other reputational sites? Do you look at LinkedIn? Do you look at Indeed and others? And, and again, as we discussed, do you monitor your, your reputational capital? And if they're dishonest postings, do you fix them? Yeah, in fact, on the second bullet, um, sorry, if you go back on the second bullet where we talk about driving sales, it, it, you know, the studies are clear that there is a large segment of the population that will pay a premium price for a product of equal quality if they believe that part of their purchase price is going to be going to helping the environment or helping society. And, and, and that's clear. And, 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 and so while ESG might have some cost, quote unquote, involved with it, um, we, we see clearly that uh, driving sales and long-term value are clear positive outcome from this. And Steve, to your point, and I think we cover this, you know, in another uh, session, um, in, in the supermarkets, goods that advertise that they're sustainably sourced or they may be organic. Of course, it's you know a, a questionable term today, but they're sustainably sourced and ethically a source. Generally, a study has shown that generally people are willing to pay 20% more for. I'm not exactly sure it costs 20% more to create these, but clearly the public has answered that they want to pay more for this kind of ethically sustainable source goods. Excellent. So here's some of, again, some of the items that we, we clearly need to communicate in, in small business. What we, we need to be very clear what our purpose is. What is our reason for existing? Why do we exist? And what makes our, our brand unique? What value do we provide and who benefits? And, and in fact, to the community and to your employees and to other stakeholders, how are you serving the greater good? That, that is such a, a critical issue. Study after study globally, especially of the young professionals and, and people in, in, in younger generations, Gen Y, Gen Z, are looking for this answer. How are you serving the greater good? If I buy your products or use your services, how are you serving the greater good? And of course, then again, we say, what is important and how do you measure success? And you have to ask yourself that question. And then how will you achieve long-term sustainable growth? How will you get there? Is there a plan? And how do you measure results? And how do you measure outcomes? But, but I, I, Steve, I, I think the most important thing is, is, especially for the next generation, how are you answering the question about your brand? How are you serving the greater good? Precisely, and that comes back to your co your cohorts of stakeholders, focusing on your stakeholders with a clear, concise, consistent purpose. In incredibly important today. So we, so we talk about talk through a couple of examples on communicating by cohort. I think this is this will be might be helpful to, to some of our viewers. So go, why don't you go ahead with the employees? Sure. Steve mentioned that uh, there's literally a, a talent shortage today. Uh, there's huge turnover, the great resignation crisis, the great retirement crisis. So how do you maintain stability among your employees? How do you make them want to work for you? So in the ESG model, human capital is really one of the critical elements of the S or the social. And I would argue 
the most important. Stability, intelligent workforce. We discussed this, but this is really, really critical to your future success. How they interact with customers. What are the business processes that they know that may not actually be modeled out, but the intellectual knowledge internally it is so critical to an efficient operation and effective output. So communicating the importance is key to a stable and satisfied workforce. And here's some of the, the metrics, again, that, that you can use. And, and you can share them if, you're, if, if these are positive impacts, share them with your employees, especially against your competitors in, 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 in your same industry. Your turnover rate, your promotions by gender, age, and sex. The average time in a position, especially if you're a growing business, are you promoting the right people? Are you training them? Are you educating them? What is the employee satisfaction? And how does it rate against your peers and against others within your industry? And one of the interesting things is we talk a lot about reviews, but today really the annual review is obsolete. The best practice today is to give continuous and immediate feedback uh, to uh, your employees. And more importantly, if additional training or remediation is needed, to do that as well, to invest in your employees. Wage parity, people are leaving because of, 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 of wages. So how do you compare your wages of your employees at all levels against others within the community? And how do the employees view themselves in terms of their community? How does the community view them? Are they ethical? Promotions, are they fair? And this is so classic, this is a classic case in, in small business, nepotism, promotion based on family relationships, based on relationships. And does that inhibit fair treatment of non-nepotistic employees? And then work, work life balance. I've heard of interviews where the employee just leaves the interview because this has not satisfied them in this company they're looking for, the work-life balance. It, it, it has to be critically important and reviewed today in, in, in uh, entering new people. And what are the welfare and health benefits? So critical today. And how do they compare against other companies within your peers? Rick, 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 if I could just add a couple of things. I'm sorry, if we can go back to, to, to the previous slide. Um, the, the, a couple of things that I think you mentioned are, are hugely worth echoing. But the first one is, in terms of communication, you know, we're gonna, we were going to sort of talk about this at the end, but let me, let me raise it now. There is a ma massive criticism going on at the moment around ESG communications and reporting. And that is that there tends to be, for some companies, an overstatement or exaggeration of environmental impact and positive environmental impact and positive social impact. And, and you know, part of the reason is it's not that, 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 that these companies are unethical, but there's lots of pressure to begin to say that you're doing good things, you're doing good things, you're focusing on ESG, you're focusing on ESG. And that's, and, and that's causing some companies to overstate the positive and in some cases, understate or ignore the negative. And, and so I, 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 you know, we are firm believers that transparency means transparency, good and bad. And, and we find that stakeholders really embrace this idea that basically says, let's pick one here and say, say look, we've, we've done an evaluation uh, with, our, with our employees and they don't believe, the majority don't believe work-life balance is good. So now we've heard them loud and clear and we now have a plan in place to sort of address that issue and ensure that issue doesn't continue on in the future. So again, a little bit of a negative communication, but at the same time, you're saying, hey, we're at least investigating these things, we're listening, and we're responding. And, and so I think, I think it's critical on the communication side to think about transparency as both, look, hey, we have, we're doing better than we did, but we have a lot more work to do around these certain areas. Right? By the way, the uh, SEC Securities Exchange Commission uh, last week uh, for public companies just came out with enforcement actions against companies that were greenwashing. They were saying, oh, we're so much better in this area than we were, but in fact, they were not. And now they have been fined for that. So, uh, you know, we, we have to also beware of overstating, as you suggest, what we're doing and also accepting if we're not there yet. 
And, and I think the final thing on the slide I'll say is that employees, while, while compensation is certainly always going to be important and, and, and promotion track or career progress, um, you know, they're making decisions to leave or to join companies in less than a year. So annual reports or annual evaluations are way too late. They're already out the door at that point. But, but, but increasingly, surveys will tell you that employees of, of all ages, particularly younger, will, will go to companies that, that, in spite of compensation and other things, one of their priorities will be the company is doing the right thing in ESG. And that will attract them and make them more passionate about working for that company. Go to the next slide, please. Yeah. Okay, Rick. I was yeah. talking to Steve that I, I lived in the Netherlands for a number of years and I worked there. Uh, but and and there was a cultural norm because culture plays a big part in uh, in in ESG. And um, their focus was lifetime relationships with vendors and suppliers, with employees and with investors. And of course, this is not doable in the States, but there are ways to uh, ensure honesty uh, uh, among the stakeholders. And that's clearly open and honest communication and fair dealing, maintaining excellent trade relationships and excellent interpersonal relationships. And what was the last time if you have employees, you told employees, gee, you're really doing a jo good job. I really need you. I really value you. I mean, those are the types of things that actually create long-term value and sustainable value within the organization. And of course, supply chain sourcing, because not only the shortages of supply and the interruptions and the interruptions of supply, but basically people questioning where the, the material goods are coming from. And, and in California, they passed a law, basically uh, the child labor law, which uh, you have to disclose down the supply chain whether underage workers are actually uh, creating uh, those goods, even though you're not the creator of those goods. So this, it's, it's absolutely critical to look at it. And frankly, it doesn't hurt to come back as a brand and say, gee, you know, we sustainably source our goods. And in fact, there are a lot of uh, manufacturing companies that state this that charge more for it and actually are highly valued among customers next slide please governance is complicated right so i hope i, I i'm looking forward to you simplifying it for us yeah governance really is your honest and ethical dealing and i define it with your community principally positive leadership and and your employees view you as as a positive leader you, you fairly treat your employees, you're open and honest, and frankly, if you haven't hit your goals, you're open and honest about them, but you also have solutions on, on how you intend to get there. Nobody succeeds 100%, but you have to acknowledge when you don't that you have, that's aspirational as well. Uh, how are you positioning yourself in the community? The community depends on you. For, for taxation, for health, education, and welfare, for paying police and so forth. So, so again, this is so critical. Your message is your brand and will attract in your community young professionals to join you. Social and reputational capital is driving employee opportunities. Again, we ask, how are you listed and how are you viewed on the internet and in social media? So clearly, and Steve, you, you pointed out, clearly messaging and, and, and positive communication are critical. Exactly. Next slide, please. So, so this is um, where we are concluding and we'll open it up for questions following this slide, but we wanted to leave you with a couple of messages. So, so, so you know, we call it signals, communication, but signaling your commitment to, 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 to this integrated notion of the triple bottom line of people, planet and profits is massively important. But again, I, I hasten to add that, you know, companies don't want to be everything to everyone and, and picking your spots, picking your priorities, the way Bombas picked socks, donating socks to a homeless shelter is really the best sort of at least initial step forward. And, and, and then as Bombas did, you can expand as you sort of uh, mature through the process. But picking one passion area, if you're just getting started, is, is probably the best course of action. The, the other is, is, you know, Rick 
spoke quite a bit about stakeholder cohorts and they're all different types like employees and vendors, but there's nothing that's gonna replace going out and talking to them, going out and meeting with them, getting, getting groups together to discuss issues. These can't be guessing games. You really have to go out and interact with each of these cohorts to understand fully what their expectations are. Uh, and, and these expectations change. And, and this is an iterative process. You, you, know, you, you begin with a purpose, you begin with a strategy, you begin with an approach, and then and, and it's a journey. You continue to modify and change it as more information comes in, as you mature more as an organization, and as as the the world changes, which it, which it, which the velocity of change now is is really incredible. As we get to the last checkpoint, though, this is the this is where the rubber really meets the road. This is where it becomes a little bit of a challenge. Is you have great vision, great purpose statements, great strategy, but at some point you need to link that to actual performance, either through quantitative measures like diversity measures or compensation measures or qualitative measures in terms of here are some of the percentage movements or here's how we're uh, contributing to social responsibility or environmental stewardship. And, and this is where it takes a little bit of time to figure out how you capture the information and the data, how you quantify or qualify that data, and what's the best mode for communicating that data. Is it through social media? Is it through websites? Is it through a formal report? Is it through a combination of those? And what language are you using to communicate that based on the cohorts that you're communicating with? In our first webinar, we talked quite a bit about ESG lingo. There are many terms. Many of them are confusing when it comes to ESG. So part of the stakeholder engagement is to understand not only what their expectations and requirements are, but what language, quote unquote, they're speaking in terms of the ESG domain and communicating in simple terms in the languages in the language they understand. So if we go to the next slide with that, we are at our conclusion. We hope this was valuable. I, I want to thank you for your attention and I'll turn it back over to our host. Great, thanks so much, uh, Steve and Rick. Oh, it was always very, very insightful. Um, I'm gonna refer to my colleague, Joe Peterson, in a quick moment, but a couple of quick takeaways for me. I think that's really useful. I think a lot of the folks that are on board here, you know, entrepreneurs with very, you know, uh, smaller sized businesses, but I think the thing that I always enjoy about the presentation that you all offer is that um, the applications that kind of uh, convert down from, you know, Bombas and other kind of larger scale businesses to kind of things that folks can kind of work on. So um, a couple of, you know, items that I just wanted to reiterate that that were really useful. I think it's kind of the what, you know, sort of Steve had talked about, you know, brand identity, about defining your passion. Um, I think if you're a small business, this is clearly something you can still do. Like what's most important to you? What do you want to, that one item, I guess, that he referenced about that you want to make sure that you're getting across, you know, to your prospective customers, to your employees, to other folks that are kind of learning more about you. I think that's really, really insightful. Um, but who you're trying to reach, I think the slide with the stakeholders and the different components that are kind of in your universe and, you know, how you want to be able to message that you know, to these folks. I think uh, Rick, I think was one that mentioned kind of, you know, messages is your brand. I think sort of thinking about like, you know, what is it that you want to be able to get across to these folks? Um, and then the where you're going to do it. And I think that hopefully that can be kind of an area that you know, potentially some of our business advisors might be able to kind of hone in on. I think, you know, the work about, you know, the reputational work, your work about, you know, being able to access and kind of be able to communicate on social media and other places about, you know, what you're doing with respect to environmental and social and governments. You know, I think that this is really just, it is so crucial. So thinking about messaging, thinking about, you know, how you can kind of get up across, you know, what you as a small business owner are doing in this universe so that your range of stakeholders really can think, so highly of you. So, um, you know, a couple of things that kind of I, you know, really latched on to, and I think that were really, really insightful. I think, you know, whether you're a, a one person place or, you know, a business of, 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 of tens of thousands. So I think these are really kind of important things for folks to digest and um, hopefully uh, integrate into their business models. And Andrew, messaging and brand identity is the great equalizer between the large organization and the small one. Sure. Thank you. Obviously, if you have any questions for us or things that you want to pursue, whether it's through 
um, incorporating the ESG into your business model and or other you know, business related topics, again, feel free to reach out to us uh, here at the Small Business Development Center. Our email address is also in the chat. It's sbdc at pace.edu. Great. Well, Andrew, Andrew and Joseph and audience, thank you for the opportunity and the time today. We, we enjoyed that. Thank you. It's an honor to be able to present this. Great. Stephen Rick, thanks again. As always, very insightful work. Again, um, appreciate your time and so glad you're able to join us today. And Stephen Rick, thanks again very much.